Welcome everybody. I mean, it's nice to see you here. Yeah, I'm gonna give this masterclass. Uh, I see a masterclass as something that is sort of a opportunity for you to learn how, well, how I do physics uh, and how you can even, well, take questions that you have yourself about nature and make that an important thing in your mind. So what I actually decided to do when I first prepared was to make it very interactive in the sense that uh, I would like you to think about questions that normally we maybe not think about but which are, can be on the back of our mind when we do research. So what I did, actually I made a quiz uh, online um, which you can do yourself where there are some questions about things like um, what is quantum field theory? Uh, can we, why do we use it? Is it something that we can view as a fundamental description of nature? And yes, uh, why? And if not, why not? And so these are questions that in my mind always direct me in how I do research. So for me, quantum field theory, since the time of Wilson, became clear that it, it's an effective description of nature that should be thought of as a low energy description that can only come about when you have integrated out degrees of freedom and so it's only to meant to describe something effectively. So I don't believe actually that quantum field theory is a part of describing the fundamental aspects of nature. And this is precisely because I we learned for any system, I mean in condensed matter for instance, if you have a discrete system where you have lattice or uh, atoms it makes of, but if you go to low enough energy, you can look at the relevant degrees of freedom and turn it into a quantum field theory. And that is a very good description of physics in systems that are not fundamentally described by uh, quantum field theory. So quantum field theory is for me not the language in which I want to understand things like gravity or what is space time and things like that. So it's for me, it's, it's helping me to describe certain parts of nature at low energies, but I don't think of it as a fundamental description. And there's an important reason for that indeed, and that's also that quantum of gravity actually cannot be quantized in the way of quantum field theory. Uh, there are other things about gravity that are very different than normal quantum field theories. And also that tells me that even general relativity should be thought of as an effective description. And so when I start thinking about questions about, well, that involve gravity and um, quantum field theory, then I always think that, well, that's a low energy description and there must be something underlying it from which it's, it's described, uh, derived. So what I'm gonna talk about, actually, this is also the title, that I think that most of the things in nature are emergent and that our understanding of uh, the physics that we have at present is at most effective, but that we should be looking for a next layer in which we can understand more uh, things more microscopically. And the problem of quantum gravity, I think, is a unique one in the sense that I think we have clues to what that underlying description might be, but we haven't reached um, you know, the final formulation yet. And this is what makes this field so exciting. So <clears throat> what I'm gonna end with uh, today is also what I think is important questions, but also important uh, opportunities actually to make breakthroughs in our understanding of gravity and even answer questions that we have not been able to answer yet. I mean, clearly when we look at cosmology and we look at uh, things related to dark energy and, and things about, well, the, the universe uh, described as an expanding universe or something that we want to ask about the early universe, let's say like the Big Bang, those are questions where we need a better understanding of gravity uh, and in particular its connection with uh, quantum mechanics. Um, I'm gonna indeed give you now, uh, okay, maybe I should uh, actually write down that quiz, that website. I'm not gonna ask you to do it right now, now but we are gonna have a break. And so that on the quiz that I post, there are questions indeed about what is quantum field theory, what is gravity. I mean, all kinds of things that you might know about and maybe some things you don't know about, but you can just see some answers that you can point to or you just can select it as multiple choice.
And then just by thinking about those questions, you force yourself a little bit more to give you a, a perspective on what physics is and what your direction should be. I think a theoretical physicist should have some idea in his mind where he's going to go to in, when he's doing his research. For me, there's a big goal, which I will explain when I um, will give my presentation. But uh, that is always somewhere in the back of my mind. And so actually what I'm going to describe today is actually more should be seen as something that I want to go through in the next years and in making progress towards. But I have an idea about what I want to solve. And this actually, I think, helps you to find uh, next problems. If you work on a very specific problem and you want to know what's the next problem to work on, having some ideas about this sort might, might help you. So by the way, the website is called Socrative. Com. If you go there, uh, you can do it with any device. You, if you have a, a, a smartphone or, or your laptop or something, uh, then you can go there and you can log in to certain what are called rooms. And there's one room that carries my name. And they assigned a number to it, 6696. And there's one quiz in there that has some questions of the sort that I just mentioned. Um, so we're going to talk about quantum mechanics and also about cosmology. And both uh, are an extreme of our uh, view of physics. Namely, one is usually associated with the very small particle physics, and the other one is very large. And it's kind of, well, how should I say it? Um, strange that we as physicists generally don't talk that much about the scales of our normal life. We don't talk about biology because biology is too complex for us to do any physics. Most of the scales in our own environment are described by very complex phys phys physics, which we as physicists are not very good at. We're very good at things that where we can simplify things. And this is where particle physics is ideal and also cosmology is ideal. But you may wonder why that is the case. The reason is that our perspective on those parts of the universe is sort of coarse-grained. We have a much less sort of precise picture of what's going on there, and we're focusing on the most relevant parts of the dynamics that's going on there. So when we describe cosmology, we want to understand how the universe came to be, how it's now, and we involve the parameters that are important for our present state of the universe, and we forget about things that may not have been that important. In quantum field theory, we do the same thing. We indeed look at those parts of the quantum field theory that are most relevant for us. That's actually exactly what Wilson taught us, that if you integrate out the microscopic degrees of freedom, some parameters are there, but they are irrelevant for the physics at low energy, so you ignore them. And so I think the simplicity that we have sort of in the physics of, low end, of, of yeah, small scales, as well as of large scales, is kind of put in by the way that we have been looking at this. And so my Suspicion, actually, is that the physics in both cases is much more complex than if we would go and look there than we have been currently assuming about uh, nature. So this is one of my things that I, I use in, in my perspective. I'll come back to that later uh, when, when we get to the relationship between cosmology and so on. Anyway, this slide already popped up. Um, so I'm actually going to assume that all of you know enough about general relativity and also about quantum field theory. So I'm not going to go into details there. I'm going to actually jump right in to what I think uh, is exciting about this uh, field of quantum gravity, or at least the connection between gravity and um, quantum mechanics. And for me, the, the, the bekenstein hawking formula plays a key role. It's actually the central equation that has been sort of the center of our discuss discussions over the last decades. Uh, I'm not going to actually uh, say a lot about string theory, although for me it's very important uh, for my own intuition of what's going on there, but I have no time to explain any of that in the time that I have here. But I will indeed go into this discussion about quantum black holes. So I hope you all have seen at least the Schwarzschild metric and you know something like uh, what a horizon is. And then there is uh, Bekenstein and Hawking that have uh, well, 
found many, many decades ago that there's an entropy associated to the horizon and there's a temperature, the Hawking temperature, that is uh, characterized in terms of a quality that we call the surface gravity on the horizon. And this formula comes about by requiring that the way that the dynamics of black holes, um, they actually behave very much like what the laws of thermodynamics would do. If you indeed think about uh, the entropy of the area as, as an entropy and this as a temperature, it's actually more of an analogy at first because, I mean, if you write down the GR equations, they don't know about H bar. For instance, the first law which says that the change of the mass is equal to the temperature times the change of the entropy, H bar would actually drop out. But you can, can confirm that that equation indeed holds. What makes this temperature real is that Hawking indeed calculated this in, in, uh, by doing quantum field theory in the, in the neighborhood of black holes. And then he found that this is the actual temperature with this normalization. And that also gave us the, the correct formula for the entropy. But there's already immediately a discussion that went on about what really the interpretation of this formula is. And actually, I want to emphasize there are two uh, sort of competing interpretations. One is that you can think about the black hole as an object with a number of microstates. Then you would say S is the entropy is lo the log of the number of microstates. Switch off. There is. The, the log of the number of microstates, this is actually an interpretation where, which I would call it's the thermal entropy also. Uh, but there's also another interpretation that I'm going to mention later, namely that of an entanglement entropy. And an entanglement entropy is something else. Uh, and and uh, it actually also is connecting to diff two different ways of thinking about uh, black holes, namely as black holes as being formed by matter that fall into the black hole or as uh, the way that the geometry is written down when you extend it uh, using uh, general relativity in the maximal way. Yes, okay, here's actually, yeah. This is actually indeed the extension that you get. You get indeed uh, a, a space that's larger than the black hole, geometry on the outside. The horizon, actually, this is a, called the Penrose diagram. Full view has never seen a Penrose diagram. You know this story? You've never seen it? So a Penrose diagram is actually a depiction of space-time where we uh, think about light going in 45 degrees. And in this picture, actually, the horizon is on this side. And this is actually something that corresponds to infinity. And uh, this would see the outside of the black hole. And this is actually an other side of the black hole because when you fall into the black hole, you fall towards the singularity. And so this is a, a nice representation that makes it all clear. Now what uh, Hawking showed is that if you think about indeed the left and the right as two parts in which we have uh, a field theory or, or just a general number of states, that the, the vacuum state actually looks like an entangled state between left and right uh, energies. Uh, so these are energy eigenstates with a, of a weight that's determined by a temperature. And that temperature actually turns out to be the Hawking temp or the inverse temperature. Beta is uh, 1 over kT, uh, uh, where the temperature is, is the, the Hawking temperature. What this makes clear is that indeed there is an entanglement in this uh, geometry. Uh, furthermore, if you uh, trace over uh, half of the states, say on the left, you get a, a density matrix. That's in general the case when you have uh, uh, entanglement. And in that density matrix, we have already, uh, well, we recognize a thermal density matrix, but also we recognize a Hamiltonian which is actually the Hamiltonian of the time evolution on the right-hand side. And then you can uh, define in terms of this density matrix an entanglement entropy that tells you how much entanglement there is between those two. Now in quantum field theory, this would diverge, uh, or if you introduce a cutoff, it would be an arbitrary number. But actually the, the whole idea is that this entanglement has something to do in quantum gravity with the Bekenstein-Hawking formula. So this Bekenstein-Hawking formula indeed in this space has the interpretation of an um, entanglement. Now I lost my connection. Oh, here we are. So here's the same equations again. And here, what is actually the picture is that, um, I'm afraid the battery is low. <laughs> 
it doesn't stay, okay. So here's the same state again, and here I have a picture of the geometry at this time slice. So this is at t equals zero, and actually uh, the black hole has a horizon which is exactly the size of this neck. So there's actually, if you look at the geometry in this slice, and you go to the plane, which is the plane of the equator, the throat of a black hole, actually, maybe I should have, um, well, let me actually. So when you think about a black hole, it actually has a throat that you go in where the horizon is sitting. And actually in this slice, there are two sides, namely the left and the right. And then there's a neck, which we call the Einstein-Rosen bridge, uh, that connects the two. And the idea actually that we have developed, and these are ideas that go back to, uh, well, actually, Herman and I actually had this idea quite before even Maldesane and Susskind, but anyway, the, the actual idea goes to von Ramstonk, who actually claimed indeed that entanglement is necessary to connect the left and the right. So entanglement, uh, that's actually the, uh, one of the central ideas that the entanglement that we have in this state is actually related to the way that the space uh, is um, connected between uh, well, the two geometries on the left and the right. So the two universes are connected by some wormhole whose size is determined by the amount of entanglement. Um, another aspect of black holes that sort of played an important role in recent um, years is um, the black hole information paradox, which is uh, actually a paradox that is about um, the information that you throw into a black hole. When you have um, a black hole that's formed by radiation. So one of the discussions that uh, plays a role, uh, where entropy plays a role, is where you form a black hole. And this is actually a different picture than they had before. Namely, this is a picture where matter falls in. And so what you think about is that this part is just Minkowski space, where the radius is in this direction. So this is just matter that eventually crosses the horizon and forms a black hole. Then the horizon is here, and the other side that I just draw is not there. And now, one of the questions that has been discussed actually has to do with uh, the entanglement that exists between these, uh, these bits. So we have uh, radiation coming out, that's the, the part B. Uh, the vacuum state, as I showed you before, actually has uh, well, entanglement between the, the left and the right part. That's this, this entanglement basically what's sitting here, although the story is, uh, well, is actually necessary to have indeed a vacuum state. But actually when the radiation is being admitted, the black hole starts also to be entangled with that radiation. And so there was a question and actually was put forward by a set of authors by well, the, the names go uh, Almeri, uh, Merolf, Polsinski, and Sully, abbreviated with AMS, and also Matur had an argument that actually showed that there's no possibility in which the black hole of this, this radiation actually can be entangled together with the black hole, or uh, the black hole can also be entangled with the radiation. There was some argument that had to do with uh, entanglement entropies between these different uh, parts of the radiation. It's called the firewall argument which basically here it's written out, the ra late radiation, which is this part, so this was early radiation, must be entangled with I, first of all, the early radiation, and the reason is actually that eventually the black hole also has to lose its entropy, so the, the entropy or the, the entanglement cannot grow, but it also must be entangled with the mode C because this state has to look like the vacuum. And these two are incompatible because this B cannot be entangled both with C and with A. Anyway, there's some inequality that implies this, but the reasoning here led to a whole discussion. And this is one of the points I want to emphasize is that the discussion was about uh, the existence of the space behind the horizon. Actually, the horizon became a point in space in which we uh, actually have to, well, even debate whether it exists, yes or no. What is the, 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 the whether a black hole uh, actually has a regular horizon as general relativity would say. Uh, so there is a singularity here. Normally you would say this is where quantum gravity effects become important. But this whole argument actually showed that even horizons are places where we should uh, in think about the quantum effects uh, of gravity. <laughs>
And the picture that uh, came out of this, which I will refer to uh, a little later, is that um, the entanglement uh, that I already mentioned gives rise to sort of these Einstein-Rosen bridges. So this is actually the, the, the connect of uh, the black hole on one side. Previously, I had two sides, and then indeed this neck continues to the other side, and you had sort of the other side of the, the black hole. When the horizon is formed by a collapse of matter, actually this other side is not there. So, but there is entanglement between the black hole and the early radiation. And so the idea of, and this is called, uh, well, the, the EPR is ER idea, is that there's indeed another type of wormhole that actually goes not from the black hole uh, to the other side, but actually connects it to the particles that have been uh, emitted. So these are like tiny wormholes, and they all form together one black wormhole that actually connects to this side. So this is the, the picture of the black hole uh, from the outside, where you go towards the horizon being here. And then the entanglement is not with the other side, but actually with particles that are being emitted on this side. And this uh, indeed sort of is a picture of a black hole that's very different from the ones that we normally would draw. And the reason is that indeed the entanglement is not with the other side, but with the emitted uh, radiation. I'm mentioning this because I'm going to indeed use, refer back to this uh, during the discussion about uh, cosmology. This is actually another representation that actually came from some popular articles on, on this. So this is the usual wormhole where we have two black holes connected by this uh, Einstein-Rosen bridge. Uh, so two black holes uh, that you can think about as being entangled. Uh, but now, uh, the black, this is another, a new type of wormhole where indeed the black hole is not entangled with another black hole, but actually with the radiation, with the photons or other particles that have been emitted. And instead of representing, therefore, the wormhole uh, this way, where you have, uh, well, all the entanglement between two black holes, you actually represent it by many tiny wormholes that, uh, well, are connected to the emitted uh, radiation. This is a very different picture of space-time than we normally would get out of general relativity. And actually, this is one of the reasons why I'm mentioning that thinking about uh, black holes will th make us think about uh, space-time in different ways than we normally would have done, um, um, well, without having these questions. So what I'm going to do, uh, this is actually just the part about black holes that I'm going to uh, leave for the moment. What I'm going to do for the rest, actually, is going to talk about um, mostly the, the things we've learned about. Yes, there's a question here. Yes, sir. I have a question about the, the picture on the top. Yeah. When you think about the Penrose diagram of this type of wormhole, yes. then the singularity is the same singularity, right? It's the same line at the top of the Penrose diagram. Yes. But here it seems as though, and it's also what you say, that there's two different black holes. But they seem to come together in the Penrose diagram. How does it work? Yes, uh, uh, let me indeed go back to that Penrose diagram. So this is the one black hole and it's the other black hole. And there are two in, in the picture that I have uh, here. You might say there are actually two ways in which I can connect those black holes. They may be indeed in different parts of space. But I'm only interested in this connection here. And so in the Penrose diagram, I see uh, this part of the space. And uh, so what you call the singularity is actually in the origin of the two uh, black holes. Um, so this geometry that I've shown is actually the geometry at t equals 0. So what happens when you go forward where the singularity happens is actually that the size of this wormhole shrinks and collapses to a point because the size uh, of the wormhole was actually the, originally the area of the horizon. The, area, the horizon is set, actually sitting at this point. But when you go in, the, the wormhole actually shrinks. So there's no way even to go through. You will actually fall in, and then you will hit this singularity. And there's another observer that fall in from the other side and will also hit that singularity. And you can think about that, indeed, as the two observers that are on one on one near the one black hole, one near the other, and they fall into the, the wormhole, and they could meet somewhere in the middle. And this is what this space-time diagram actually is uh, portraying, is that there is indeed a way in which there may be communication if two 
observers decide to fall into the black hole. And so you should think about this singularity as really being the same for the two black holes in that case. However, I should have said that there's a whole discussion, and, and actually the recent literature is about can we do this in real life? And can we go through these wormholes, for instance, uh, is, is there a way of even avoiding hitting the singularity? And then there, there's still discussion about what is really happening at these horizons. So one of the questions in the quiz, if you will actually uh, go through it, is indeed what happens at the horizon. I give a number of possibilities, and it turns out that uh, I think the, the, the consensus has not been reached yet exactly what, what horizons are, and part of this has to do with indeed resolving precisely this uh, picture of the question about can we indeed cross from one side to the other, and in what way is it possible even to communicate from between left and right? Eddie? Yeah? Yeah. In our universe, do we expect to have enough matter uh, to account for the entropy of all the black holes through ER equals CTR? So I'm going to indeed say a little bit more about uh, entropy. Uh, and the entropy count in our universe. If you count how many, much um, entropy is sitting in all the big black holes that we know about. The order of magnitude is uh, about 10 to the 100 or maybe about 10 to the 110. Well, if you look at all the entropy that we know about that's sitting in matter, it's all, at most 10 to the 90. So it's not clear how those black holes have formed and how they reached all of the entropy uh, which we know about. So if you ask, is the entropy of a black hole equal to the entropy that formed it? Then, um, then I would say it's not clear. I mean, I would say, probably say no, because I think most matter will contain much less entropy than the entropy of a black hole. So when we form a black hole, the entropy increases by a drastic amount, by an enormous amount, from the entropy that we have uh, in matter. And I would say it's a different kind of entropy, and even the state that the matter must be in when it forms a black hole, when it sort of goes over and forms a black hole, uh, must be a much more entropic state than the one that we can normally form from uh, matter. And actually, I have something to say about later. This has to do even with the way we understand black holes in, uh, in string theory. Uh, in string theory, we can indeed study this question about how do you form black holes, how do they get all of their entropy. And then we find that, uh, indeed, the way we should describe it is a very different phase of the theory where there's much more entropy in the, in the excitations than that normally is there when we have ordinary matter. So, I mean, I'm, maybe that doesn't answer your question fully, but I would have said that um, I think it's still a puzzle about how all of these black holes have formed, even for astronomers. They, they have trouble explaining how we have this, these enormous large black holes in the lifetime of the universe. Is it, is it the same mismatch as the, as the one of the Hawking radiation, the one of the spiral problem, or is it an entirely different story? So the, the question about um, the firewall problem is one that makes us, should make us wonder what a horizon really is. Yeah, yeah. And because uh, what the firewall problem says is that, that if you look at the black hole from the outside, and uh, so what actually has to be discussed there is you have to wait uh, for the black hole to evaporate for a long time. And then eventually, when it has been entangled so much with its radiation, there is a way in which we then can no longer associate an insight to it. And that is the, from the point of view of someone that's indeed staying on the outside. We have other type of horizons, and then we also, in, in cosmology, we have horizons, and we can maybe ask the same questions there. And uh, so I would have said that if we really understand uh, horizons for black holes and for cosmology, actually, this question about black holes in the universe may actually be a related point because they may be describing a similar phase of space-time as, as what uh, we have in cosmology. So what I'm going to talk about uh, next is uh, more uh, a global picture of a space-time and I'll indeed focus on two types of uh, spaces, uh, anti de Sitter space and de Sitter space. The Sitter space is most interesting, of course, because that's the one that's most like our universe. String theorists, string theorists, however, like anti de Sitter space for uh, very uh, specific reasons. Uh, the reasons namely being that uh, 
it's for this case that we can have a much more precise description. So let me actually go through the two uh, geometries. So uh, the difference is uh, a, a sign in the metric. Uh, the minus sign is actually the sitter space, and the plus sign is anti the sitter space. But the way they look is very different. I mean, I should point out here, the sitter space is the outside of this region, I mean, this uh, form. I mean, so the, 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 the sitter space is the boundary of this object. And so it has uh, something that looks like it's expanding. Actually, there's part of it that is used for an expanding universe, which is sort of this right half. Um, there's also a, a view where you, it's actually static. Namely, if I stay here on this line, then this part of the space is actually a static geometry, uh, where the horizon, again, is sitting on these lines. And so there's a horizon in here, because when you have a minus sign, uh, this part of the metric goes to 0. And uh, this also goes to 0. But anyway, this part of the metric actually determines where the horizon is sitting. And there's, well, indeed, horizons, but there's not a boundary. anti the space is different. anti the space is the inside of this region. And therefore, it does have a boundary. And it has a negative curvature. So the sitter space is positively curved and anti the space negatively curved. And this is where we have dark energy, uh, which sort of is responsible for the positive cosmological constant or the positive curvature. Here, there's uh, only a negative uh, cosmological constant. And this is the space which has a boundary. And this is where we can understand, uh, well, quantum gravity much more precisely by uh, the duality that was uh, discovered in string theory, namely that between a conformal field theory on the boundary and, and the bulk of anti de space. Now, in the presentation, what I want to get to is eventually uh, well, maybe things we can learn about the sitter space, but I will first go through things that we know about in anti de sitter space. In particular, I want to explain how we think about uh, well, where gravity sort of comes from, uh, this idea about emergent gravity, and how did we uh, come to the conclusion that gravity in this case must be uh, emergent. It has to do with the fact, indeed, that there's a duality between a theory on the boundary without gravity, which is the conformal field theory, and a theory inside the bulk, which is uh, a gravity theory. Um, and actually, the way we understand now how the gravity comes about is by indeed thinking about the boundary theory uh, well, in terms of entanglement. And then we want to build the geometry from uh, the notions of the quantum mechanics of the boundary. And again, a key formula, the same key formula, is actually playing a role here. Uh, it goes back to Rhea and Taganiagi. Uh, it's again the same formula that Hawking and Bekenstein wrote down, although it has now uh, a slightly different interpretation again. It's not a black hole that we have here, but we do have a horizon. So uh, maybe I should point, uh, explain what this picture looks like. Um, so this is a, a part of the boundary. So what I've drawn here is a, a line here that is actually think about as a segment on the boundary that can be a part of space. And then on top of that, I draw uh, a line. There's some perspective in the picture which makes it sort of look uh, skew because the boundary is like a plane. But I also need to draw is some part of the bulk which is perpendicular to it. Uh, this is called a causal diamond in the sense that there is a causal future of this region. And then if you trace this backwards also by sending sort of light rays into the bulk, you obtain a region of space that is connected to this and which has a, a surface here which plays the role of a horizon. Actually, it's uh, the horizon that an observer would see who would accelerate uh, through space in the bulk and, and end up on the boundary in the back here. So it would start here and then accelerating. And accelerated observers also see horizons. It's called the Rindler horizon. In this case, actually, it's a Rindler ADS because we're in anti de space. So this is a picture of the space at a fixed time. And the space, indeed, is negatively curved also. And the boundary is sitting here. And so the two points that I've pointed here are sitting here. And this is the line that uh, I draw there. Now, this actually has an inside and an outside. And I didn't even, did I write this down? Well, let me actually, did I mention? Yeah, I mentioned already, entanglement entropy can be obtained by, indeed, tracing over the part of the Hilbert space of the inside compared to the outside. And there's again a notion called entanglement entropy that is then given by the area uh, 
of this, uh, this surface. And actually, it's, it's called a minimal surface in the sense that actually if you turned out that if you take the boundary here, that you ask which surface has the minimal area that connects to the boundary, it actually is precisely the same surface. Now, one thing that I conclude from this is actually that uh, anti sitter space is a unique state, uh, has a unique vacuum state. And what we've calculated here is actually that there is uh, an entanglement in this vacuum state that satisfies this law. It's kind of like an area law. And one way to understand this actually is indeed thinking about the bulk as something that uh, is made out of entanglement. Precisely in the way that I already described this black, with black holes, you can even think about uh, anti sitter space as being glued together with entanglement. This indeed is a picture, um, actually I think something dropped off here. Anyway, this is a picture of anti sitter space. It's the same uh, picture I had before, uh, where you have um, the boundary, and this is indeed the space. And we can think about the entanglement that I just uh, have as indeed building up the, the, the space time. And so there's a way you can entangle the qubits. So one th way to think about entanglement is that there is sort of local quantum degrees of freedom on the boundary that are, uh, I should have said this uh, earlier, that um, the, the, the normal direction we can usually think about as indeed as integrating out uh, degrees of freedom. It's like an RG flow. And so there's a number of bits here on the, on the next slide that line that are entangled with the ones on the inside. And this is a picture that people have made of space-time as made, made out of entangled, uh, well, I would say qubits, but here it said particles. It actually, I don't think about this as particles. It's really the, the, the degrees of freedom that make up the boundary theory, but then coarse-grained when you go inward. So the number of uh, points that you have inside is every time smaller, and you build up the space-time through entanglement. And why is it sort of entanglement that plays the role of, uh, well, making the space-time? It's the same idea that we had with the, with the, the, the wormholes. Um, so here I have two regions of the boundary. They are entangled, that's A and B. And then the picture should be that the area of any th horizon that's sitting in between uh, is actually describing how much entanglement you have between A and B. And the idea is that if the amount of entanglement indeed would be reduced, that the space-time geometry would react to it. So amount of entanglement gets less, then you have to squeeze this area to become smaller. And you can even reduce and take out all of the entanglement. And then the space should really uh, split into two. So we should get a picture that entanglement actually is the way uh, that space and time are glued uh, together. So these are things that have been developed uh, in, in uh, recent years by uh, Van Ramsdonk already mentioned. Uh, there's indeed people that have worked on the tensor networks. I should mention Swingle and, uh, and others that sort of proposed this picture of space time. But also, uh, indeed, the idea is that uh, entanglement is necessary for connectivity actually is, is indeed uh, well, playing a key role in those discussions. One of the ways of viewing this is what is called a bit thread picture. So this is a picture of the same region on the boundary where uh, the entanglement uh, goes through this line. So what is being entangled are things that live in one side with things that live on the other side. Well, the lines that are drawn here are actually uh, entangled particle of your yeah, bits on this region with uh, the region on the other side. And you're drawing uh, lines between one quantum and another quantum that is uh, being uh, entangled. And they go through this surface. And the amount of uh, entanglement should be then be equal to that surface. And this is another picture of the same idea. Um, and it is Friedman and Hedrick actually that, that proposed this. Uh, namely as follows, maybe I should even draw it yeah, maybe I should show this this way first. Um, yeah, you can think about indeed this region A as being entangled with the outside, and we're drawing lines indicating that uh, entanglement. And then we want to know why the entanglement is indeed equal to that area. And there is actually a picture that explains this. Uh, 
It's called uh, the max flow min cut principle, and maybe I should explain that. So when I have uh, entanglement between this region and this region, I'm going to represent that uh, by these lines. And the number of lines is equal to the amount of entanglement between the left-hand side and the right-hand side. But now you see that the geometry changes, and in particular there can be parts of the geometry where the, the, the surface area is smaller. Now there's a condition that I'm going to put as many lines uh, that are possible, but provided that the density of those lines never can exceed the density of the at the Planck length. So in the sense that if there's some surface of an area A, the amount of entanglement can never be larger than this A over 4G. And so there's a bottleneck here, uh, where, which determines how much entanglement th there can be between left and right. And indeed, this, surf this line actually is the bottleneck in the sense it's a surface that is minimal area. And therefore, it also uh, restricts the flow of entanglement from the inside to the outside in a way that makes it maximally equal to this uh, area of that surface. And we're going to actually maximize the flow, but we have to impose this, the minimum cut that, namely, that, that must be the minimal area. And then you actually get exactly the, the formula that Rian Taganyagi uh, had, namely that the um, entanglement entropy must be equal to the area of that, that surface. By the way, there are corrections in general, uh, which have to do with the fact that uh, sometimes when you have entanglement of particles in the bulk, you can also think about those as little lines that connect them, but they are not counted in the area. By the way, this picture where there's an entanglement sort of line going out can be thought of a little bit uh, as what I had before with these little wormholes. Uh, and so there's some way in which that indeed entanglement uh, can escape as being counted in the area. And that's uh, the, what are called corrections in, in 1 over n. Um, now, there is a story about emergent gravity that indeed takes this uh, formula. Um, actually, it's a bit of a summary what I, I, I'm making here uh, as the central starting point. Um, namely, if we assume this formula, then there's a way of deriving uh, gravity from it that I'm going to explain in a minute. But now what we're going to do is actually going to turn it around where we take this formula as given. And then we can uh, indeed get uh, a picture of emergent space, time, and gravity out of this. Um, yeah, these are things I already mentioned in bef before. Um, by the way, this entanglement uh, can be uh, seen as being part of a uh, measuring the entanglement across the horizon, the same formulas that I wrote down before. Actually, I'm going to write it slightly differently in this quantity ki in there. Um, this is actually a picture of the horizon of Rindler uh, ADS, the same uh, space that I talked about, namely this for this accelerated observer. But uh, this is a Penrose diagram again where the horizon is sitting here and the boundaries are these lines. Um, if you draw the space and go through here, the space looks like this. Namely, this was the Rindler, uh, the ADS uh, geometry and the horizon actually can be taken to be going right across from here. I, first, I drew these other lines, but actually this is uh, equivalent representation of it, where you indeed have just the left and the right being entangled. The same picture actually can also be used for other geometries. Namely, if I have a, a black hole with this einstein rosen bridge, there's a singularity on this line. And in ADS, actually, the geometry looks exactly like this uh, again. But the picture is, uh, interpretation is different. So for Rindler ADS, this point was uh, this horizon in the middle. For a black hole, uh, the horizon is sort of like a, a sphere in the middle, and this is this line. So we have a black hole, uh, which is the boundary on one side, and then the horizon is, is this, and then it should be glued together with another black hole on the other side. It uses the same Penrose diagram. I'm going to talk later about the sitter space, and actually the sitter space has a similar picture. So the sitter space uh, also has a Penrose diagram like this, and where the, this is again the horizon. But in that case, this line is the origin, and this line is the 
horizon uh, inside we're living. Actually, we're going to see indeed a picture where the origin, which is the, 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 the green line is connecting this point indeed. Sorry, the origin is indeed here. And the green line here, this one, is connecting it to the horizon. And the horizon is sitting here. It's a very different picture from this one, by the way. Uh, I have to point that out. Namely here, uh, the horizon is this small circle, the black hole is small, and this is the boundary of ADS, which is this line. So the horizon is much smaller. Well, in here, uh, for the sitter space, the horizon actually is the large circle, while uh, this line indeed is the origin, and so it's the largest circle in the space is actually giving the horizon. So you already see that the sitter space has a very different uh, structure than these other uh, spaces. But this formula applies presumably for all of them, namely there's a left and a right, and they're being entangled with a certain uh, Boltzmann factor. And this is the way that the entanglement entropy of the of structure of the vacuum sort of looks like. And I've been using this in, in all of the slides I had before. Uh, this K, by the way, the reason why I introduced it is called the model of Hamiltonian. Uh, it's, it's generally defined in terms of the, uh, the state uh, any state that I can have, but in particular the vacuum state, you can uh, take the trace over one of the two Hilbert spaces, so there is two sides. I take the trace, say, of H prime, and I have a density matrix on the other side. Uh, that density matrix is written in a thermal form, and then K defines by this formula something we call the model of Hamiltonian. So it's defined by entanglement, and it becomes the generator of the boost in this time. So you might actually almost go to a picture where we start from the state and we ask how does the space-time emerge. Well, I go through these steps. I have a state psi. I, I apparently have to define some way in which it's split into two parts. And then I define a density matrix uh, by tracing over half of it. And then in terms of the density matrix, I define a uh, operator k that defines the time on that side. And the uh, entropy then should be the, the area of whatever horizon I get. So what I want to get now to is, is there a way of getting gravity out of this? And there is actually. Um, so this is uh, the anti sitter space. Uh, this is, uh, let me think, did I? Oh yeah, I should do this first. Um, yes, there is namely uh, something called the first law of entanglement entropy. These are the same formulas I had before. Uh, so I have this entropy and I can vary it. And you can go through the definition if you vary this expression in here, since rho is expressed in terms of k, uh, changing the state actually changes rho. Uh, it also changes uh, the expectation value of this operator. This operator actually is in Hamiltonian, it's like an energy. And its expectation value changes because the density matrix changes. So I call delta k, I call the trace of delta rho k. And there is an entropy uh, variation that's equal to it, namely just from the definition it follows that this equation holds. And why is this called the first law? This is the change of entropy, this is the change of energy, and in this case, you can actually take the temperature, and actually it's clear from this expression, is only h over 2 pi. And it's this equation that is going to actually help us uh, understand uh, the first law. No, actually, uh, also the, the derivation of, of Einstein equation. Um, and this is done as follows. Um, actually, I don't think I have the... Yeah, I should have mention this explicitly, um, but I, I'll, I'll go through it in a minute. There is uh, this way of writing actually the, uh, the entropy. Uh, it's the area, but it's actually possible to rewrite it in terms of um, a quantity that is equal to a killing vector. So why is there a killing vector? This psi is, is a killing vector. It's the boost generator in the space time. And this expression is a way of rewriting uh, the integral, uh, the horizon. So it's just a GR expression. It's actually uh, a particular case of what Walt uh, has discussed as his entropy. But actually, this is generally true, um, just in general relativity, that the area 
uh, can be written in terms of uh, this quantity. Um, and what I'm going to argue now is that if I indeed have the first law, which is that the variation uh, of the, the entropy is equal to the um, variation of this model Hamiltonian. So what is the model Hamiltonian? Actually, uh, it's going to be an expression. Uh, it's a homo Hamiltonian uh, of the theory. So it's written as a integral of the stress tensor. Uh, the stress tensor will live uh, on the boundary. And so this is a, a quantity that we calculate uh, in the CFT on the boundary. And when we integrate it uh, over the, the boundary, uh, we get uh, an energy. And that energy is precisely this model Hamiltonian. And it uses the same killing vector, which indeed is the time generated uh, translations here on the boundary associated to this Hamiltonian. And so when I have the variation of this quantity being equal to the variation of that quantity, which was the first law that I had on the previous slide, this equation, it actually implies a relationship between a variation on the area and a variation of a quantity that's defined on the boundary. And uh, you can actually show that that uh, variation can only be, those variations can only be equal if the field equations or the Einstein's equations are satisfied uh, in this part uh, of space. So the first law actually implies the Einstein's equations in this case. So it's almost like, indeed, if you have, uh, well, you can actually have a generalize this even by adding matter into the bulk. Uh, that actually adds a correction to it that I already mentioned, actually. Um, that actually is uh, also expressed in terms of an entanglement or actually also as an energy in the bulk, which is the energy of objects that are living here. And it, then it turns out that this equation, um, when you indeed identify this also with this term, becomes equivalent again to Einstein's equations where there's a source in the bulk uh, given by the stress energy tensor of, that, uh, uh, of the matter that we have, have in here. And so indeed there are uh, ways of getting uh, general relativity from uh, entanglement in anti de Sitter space. This, by the way, is not the main thing I want to get to because, as I said, I mean, I'm more interested in, in the sitter space. And this is the one I want to go to in the next slide. So this is, again, the picture of the sitter space. So how does it work here? I'm going to do the same logic. Uh, I'm also going to, indeed, think about can I derive, in this context, uh, gravity from entanglement? And I should say that here we have much less control because uh, the, the reason why I mentioned all the, the anti de stuff is that we have an explicit theory that lives on the boundary, which is this conformal field theory. And this is why string theory is sort of uh, restricted to this one. So what I'm going to do next is going to be less, uh, well, precise in the sense of string, uh, that we don't have a microscopic description yet of the quantum theory describing the sitter space. But I can go through the same logic and actually have the same assumptions that I made before. So I'm going to actually look at the sitter space in the following way. This is, again, uh, the coordinate system that I uh, showed before. It is actually the coordinates what are in what I call the static coordinate patch. It looks like, uh, again, what I call a causal diamond in the sense that this is the part of space. This is a, a horizon. But at this time, we live inside this part of the space. And the boundary of our world is given by a horizon and not by a, a true boundary like we have in, in anti de Sitter space. And uh, there is actually a way of thinking about this as a universe with only dark energy. So if there's no matter but only dark energy, the universe would look exactly like this. Some people would say it would be a universe that's exponentially uh, um, expanding. But that's not necessarily the case. Actually, this is the same universe actually when you have only dark energy. You can think about it as a static universe where indeed we live inside a, a space with a, with, a, with a horizon. I'm going to introduce some numbers, uh, some quantities that I also will use later. Namely, I'm going to introduce a, a length scale that's the, the, the size of the sitter horizon. There's also going to be the Hubble constant, which is the way that it's, say, if you want to think about it as an expanding universe, it's related to L in this way. And there's also a thing that I call an acceleration, 
Uh, and the reason is that indeed uh, horizons can also be thought of as being uh, associated with an acceleration like we have in, in Rindler space. And in the sitter space, there's a typical acceleration, namely, uh, it's called, it's actually the Hubble constant times uh, the speed of light, and I call this A0. And then the general formula that applies for the uh, temperature that Hawking uh, also derived actually can also apply here. And actually this is a, a space which indeed has an entropy, again because it has a horizon, but also a temperature that is set by this scale. So this is very different from uh, anti de Sitter space where there's no horizon and there's no uh, temperature, except in anti de Sitter space we created an horizon uh, by going through to accelerate it or to a Rindler uh, situation. Here there's already a horizon for a static observer that's sitting in the center. Uh, but as I said, there's no boundary, at least not at spatial infinity. If you would draw the entire Penrose diagram, there would be actually a boundar boundary at time-like uh, infinity. Uh, but that would play a very different role than, than uh, the boundary in ADS. So this is again um, the picture that I had before. So this is the Penrose diagram of the sitter space. I'm going to actually assume indeed that there is this entropy associated to the horizon. And um, here I drew explicitly what the geometry looks like. So I already pointed out that we have this line uh, when we go at t equals zero. If we do that in the sitter space, the space looks like this. We go from the North Pole to the South Pole. And now we see uh, something, uh, well, as already pointed this out, this, the horizon is actually is the biggest circle on the sphere. The space looks like a sphere. It's actually a, a three sphere. Um, if we are in, in four-dimensional the sitter space, and the horizon is on the equator, and we can put ourselves on, say, the North Pole or the South Pole. Again, you assume, and this is just by the analogy that we have already seen in ADS, that, that, that indeed the vacuum stage looks like this, and that there is an entanglement equal to the area. But what is being entangled here? Uh, in ADS, we had a quantum field theory living here that was entangled to the other side. And we even have this picture of the bit threads going through. Uh, and then we know exactly what's being entangled. However, here it's not clear because there's no boundary here because this is the origin. So if there's entanglement across this horizon, where are the, the quanta sitting? I mean, this is anti de Sitter space. So what is uh, the situation here? And I think this is really a clue if we understand this question we understand a lot more about the microscopics of, uh, and of the sitter space. Uh, well, why am I interested in it, this? Indeed, because our universe can be thought of this, and sacred, certainly the, the late universe must be looking more like this. Also, a universe in the time of inflation can be look, represented like that. So there are many reasons why we want to understand these questions. And I'm sorry. Yes? Uh, so, so is it the answers, basically? So it, uh, so pr previously, I thought that uh, you wrote this temperature as actually as a real uh, modular Hamiltonian temperature, let's say, in some kind of Bisita Rindler coordinates. But instead, this is some kind of a hunch that there should be something like that because there is a temperature like quantity or? So there is indeed a temperature. Yeah, OK. There's also a Hamiltonian because if you really look at the, that's interesting. So if you look at this, the time translations in here actually uh, go bring you along this, these lines. Okay. And so uh, if we are sitting in the center, we would stay there. Uh -huh. But an observer, for instance, that's sitting at a finite r uh, has to go along these lines and actually has to be accelerated. Okay. And so all of these observers will see this temperature. And it's the same way that Hawking calculated the temperature. Actually, this is Gibbons and Hawking that did this in this but case. So the Ruch effect will just happen for standard observers here? Or? So it's for a static observer. Yes. But there's also uh, other observers that use the same time t uh -huh. that are not in the origin. Mm -hmm. And they need to be accelerated in order to stay inside the same causal diamond. And so actually, one of the things that happens in the sitter space is that there's no distinction between the cosmological horizon and accelerated sort of Rindler horizons because it's just a matter of indeed which observer am I choosing. They all see the same horizon. So they see, so the cosmological horizon is also the Rindler horizon of another observer. And so the calculations that we've done to determine the temperature there and the entanglement actually go through here. 
You can also do it in the, the quantum field theory, writing down what these states look like, and then you find again that the quantum states look like this, where the left and the right now is indeed one side, the northern or the southern hemisphere. And so you expect there must be some entanglement in here. You can do this in quantum field theory, but again, um, we don't know whether uh, that gives rise to the entire entropy that's equal to this. Uh, so we, we actually now postulate there must be some microscopic quantum theory that uh, describes this geometry where this state can be indeed, the vacuum state can be exactly written like this, but there must be some entanglement equal to that quantity where A is the area of that horizon. And the temperature indeed is the temperature that I wrote down before. Mm -hmm. And the energy is associated to the energy that's being observed uh, by um, static observers. But why not just associate the states as a, as a states of the, like in the Rindler, uh, Rindler wedge uh, yeah. split? Just the state of, uh, of, of this, okay, so you have a quantum theory written in a specific metric, you just say it with a bulk degrees of freedom, what's the problem with that? Ah, the bulk degrees of freedom don't uh, give rise to this entanglement entropy. There's no reason why the bulk degrees of freedom would know about the Planck scale. And so the, Planck, the fact that uh, Planck uh, scale comes in, and this actually goes back to the beginning that I said, I don't think we can understand this entropy in terms of quantum field theory. And okay, the way to get this from quantum field theory is somehow to introduce a Planckian cutoff in the quantum field theory. But generally, quantum field theory has a divergent uh, entanglement entropy. But um, there are all kinds of reasons why we think that actually the uh, cutoff should be sort of more not dependent on, on, on G. But anyway, I, I, I actually don't fully, I cannot tell you exactly what are the degrees of freedom that give rise to this. But there should be, indeed, a representation of the microscopic state of this form. And if you want to think about this as, as fields in the bulk, maybe there are some ways, indeed, that we can, should think about it. Because as I told you, there is no boundary here. It's problematic, as you said. So what happened in ADS, namely, it was the entanglement between the boundary states right. that gave the entanglement. And, that's the and, and here we don't have that possibility, right. and which I think is, is really an important clue. There was a thing. Sorry. Yes. And I could purify it in many different ways. Ah, uh, this, this, okay, this is just assuming indeed that there is a, um, the only thing I'm, I'm quoting here is the energy of the other state. You're saying why would they be connected in that way? This has to do with the invariance also uh, under, I mean, if I insist that the, this state is invariant under boosts on both sides, I don't think you can write down much else. Actually, it's very similar to the thermal field double discussion. But an observer in the static visitor will not know about this. Is that correct? That's correct, because he would not know what the purification is. And actually, I'm going to make that point in a minute. Uh, I mean, I'm going to think about this as a two-sided situation, just with the black hole where I started from, that th this is like a part of space that we don't fully interact with. It's causally disconnected. It's very similar indeed for the black hole. For the black hole, we had here a singularity you could fall in. And the only way you can know about this part if there would be some way to meet with someone on that side. But uh, do we know that this side really exists? There's no real proof of that from just the point of view of that observer. And you can indeed ask all the same questions. Uh, even a firewall problem might exist here. Because also here, there is Hawking radiation or some radiation uh, entering into the, this region. So if I allow, indeed, things to evaporate for long enough, maybe there is also entanglement between the, the, the horizon and, or the, and the degrees of freedom here. And actually, this is a ba goes to the question, indeed, what is the interpretation of this entanglement entropy? Maybe there are excitations in the bulk that, that carried it. But this space, as I said, is, is anti the sitter space. So there's no a priori particles that I see there. And as I said, it's a question that I think is central and, and we should answer this. And I think when we understand it, uh, we may actually know a lot more. Uh, one of the important clues about how to interpret the sitter space is going um, 
through a calculation that's kind of well known. Um, yeah, let me formulate it as follows. Um, so when I put matter inside black hole of uh, the sitter space, so what I pointed out here is actually the causal uh, diamond. Actually, what I like to do is, so this is the origin. So there's actually a spherical symmetry around it. So I'm going to actually make this causal diamond symmetric. So because if I put a black hole here, it would actually be sitting on this line. And here is the other side. So there would be a black hole on the, on, the, on the other pole. So this is the north pole and the south pole is there. Then there would be a black hole sitting there. But I'm going to extend that diagram by adding that line to it. And this is what I've drawn here. So this is the same. So this part in the middle is what I drew before. And this is just the fact that I make the, the picture sort of symmetric because I want to think about this black hole sitting in the center of my uh, region. So the, the, the horizon is actually sitting here, but you should glue it together because this is the equator for one and this is the equator. So this is just a way of uh, cutting the sphere open so that I have the two horizons sitting here. Now what I'm going to ask indeed is what happens to the horizon when I put matter in here? And something very interesting happens which is kind of uh, confusing. Namely, if I write down the geometry, so the sitter space had uh, no potential in here because the mass is zero. But if I add the mass, then I get the same geometry that I would get in, in uh, Schwarzschild, namely with the, the potential. Uh, this is in any dimension, by the way. Um, and so this function f of r changes from 1 minus r squared over l squared to this Schwarzschild, uh, the sitter geometry. Now, the horizon is sitting where this function is equal to zero, because that's where we have generally horizons. And it actually turns out that the horizon gets displaced by a little bit. Uh, you can calculate this uh, by asking, indeed, what f of r is zero. You can say, well, if f is phi, the mass is zero, r is equal to l. So there must be a short, sh small change in the location when we add the mass. Turns out you can work that out. Uh, you find that um, this u of l is actually equal to phi times l. Just by inserting this and putting it to zero, uh, this is the expression that you get. And it, this is where phi is equal to that. And now you can calculate what that does to the area of the horizon. Mind, uh, you have to look out here, I mean, phi is negative, And that means, indeed, that the horizon gets smaller. So the u is a negative number. And it makes the horizon a little bit smaller. And as a result, the entropy actually decreases. And it decreases by an amount that's proportional to the mass m and the size uh, of the, the, the Hubble radius. So this is a, a, quite a big number. Uh, but the entropy goes down when I add matter to the sitter space. And that's strange, in a way, because you say you add something to it. But actually, one way to interpret this is that Actually, when there's no matter, the sitter space is actually in a maximally entropic state. It's namely a thermal equilibrium. It's a thermal state. Here, I've taken the state out of equilibrium, and I've reduced the entropy by this amount. And indeed, the area gets smaller uh, by, uh, by this number. I see you looking puzzled. Is there a question here? You agree with this? All right. So this is, this is a, a fun. A uh, fact about the sitter space, which I think in t uh, gives an important clue in the sense that we should think about adding mass as actually reducing the entropy. So some entropy has been taken away and put in the form of this mass, and this is not the most generic case. If I would indeed let the mass disappear again, actually the mass should be on the North Pole and the South Pole. If I let them meet each other again and join, actually uh, that would reduce, well, you can actually let them maybe annihilate even. In that case, there might be a way of even increasing the entropy uh, back to the, or, its original form. So this is uh, a thing that needs to be understood microscopically. I want to mention one way in which uh, this same fact can be understood using uh, these methods of Wald. I mentioned uh, an expression earlier on that we can write the entropy as the integral of some quantity in terms of the killing vector. This killing vector, by the way, is precisely what generates the time flow inside this causal diamond. The horizon entropy is therefore an integral on the horizon, which is the, in here. The mass can also be defined by an integral of the same quantity, but say around a 
sphere that goes a, like a Gaussian surface around the mass. And those two must be equal, or if you really count it up, actually they must, uh, the sum must be zero. There must be a minus sign. And the reason is that when I integrate this this way, I integrate both of them with the normal pointing outwards, if you understand what I'm saying. Actually, you have to therefore use a Stokes theorem to relate the two, and you end up with uh, the same equation again, that the change of the entropy plus the change of the mass is equal to zero. This is again a first law equation, very similar to what I had before. Um, and it is now the way that gravity sort of works in, in uh, the sitter space instead of now anti the sitter space. So matter removes part of the the sitter entropy. That's again expressed like this because if I bring this to the right hand side, I end up uh, with a minus sign. Um, so I go back to the same ideas again, what I said before, it has this first law and we're going to derive uh, and think, uh, gravity from it. But now I'm going to do this in a way where it applies both to anti de Sitter as well as to the Sitter space. This is actually due to uh, Ted Jacobson, who indeed thinks about this causal diamond as part of the space-time. And we think about the entropy as being related to the area. And the change of the entanglement of, of, of the Hamiltonian is actually something that is related to the energy uh, defined by this uh, killing vector or by this, uh, well, time flow. This, by the way, is an explicit expression of this quantity Q if you want to re rewrite this entropy in terms of um, um, an integral on the, on the boundary. And it turns out, indeed, that if you want to relate these two quantities, uh, that you have to impose an equation. For instance, if there's no energy, uh, you want to impose that the, the entropy variation is zero, or you can say if there's uh, the fact that this quantity is closed is actually an important um, equation, namely it gives you exactly the Einstein's equation. And that is exactly what we needed to relate, for instance, in this situation, the, this integral to that integral, because then you can, or the variation of it, I should say, because then you can indeed uh, trans, well, make, the, make use of Stokes' law uh, by re relating the integral over the horizon to the integral over some other surface. Uh, already uh, had this expression before, namely that the model Hamiltonian can be written as an integral of a local uh, stress energy tensor where this is the killing vector. Turns out that uh, when there's conformal matter uh, and you can think about this as a conformal killing vector, uh, then you can write it even in this form. Uh, so this was actually used uh, also in the, in the anti sitter situation, but you can use a very similar uh, causal diamond in any uh, conformally flat uh, geometry, because as I said, I mean, if I think about this as just, uh, say, a part, a part of the sitter space or even flat space or, or anti de Sitter space, these kind of causal diamonds can be defined in all of those space times. And then you have this uh, vector because the, all of those space times admit the same uh, conformal killing vector. Um, and this is indeed what Jacobson showed. It's the same equation again, I mean I'm just in that sense repeating myself, but actually the the, the change of the area is equal to minus the change of this Hamiltonian. And it turns out that this is, as I said, equivalent uh, to uh, the Einstein's equations, but you can also think about this again now as a first law, because this is the change of the entanglement entropy and this is the change of the Hamiltonian, except there is this funny minus sign. One thing that uh, needs to be imposed, which Jacobson made very clear, is that uh, if you vary something here on the left and on the right, you're comparing two geometries uh, where I added matter, for instance, inside this diamond. The area changes, but why does the area change? Something has to be kept constant in order to compare the two geometries. And it turned out, it was kind of a surprising fact, that the volume is the thing that needs to be kept constant. So that Jacobson showed that if you keep the volume inside here constant and you add matter, that the area has to be uh, decreasing. And this equation is equivalent to the Einstein's equations. And we like to interpret this in terms of entanglement in, in this uh, geometry. How am I doing with time, by the way? I think it's about time for a break or not?
quarter to nine? It's now quarter to nine, am I right? Uh, so actually, anyway, what, just to summarize, I've actually talked m for most of the whole this uh, presentation about the same equation many times. Namely, it is a first law of entanglement entropy that kind of uh, plays this central role, and it's related to the Einstein's equations. I described this first in anti de Sitter space, but now I'm going to go through the same steps in the Sitter space, and we have to indeed deal with, first of all, understanding this minus sign, but also, uh, indeed, uh, well, can we understand now how gravity works in the Sitter space? And actually what I will uh, lead to uh, later is that indeed, because there's no boundary where we can put a conformal field theory in the Sitter space, we have to interpret these entanglements of these entropies in a very different way than in anti de Sitter space. And this will need, lead to uh, some surprises maybe uh, when, I, when we're gonna understand this question more precisely. I'm gonna indeed argue later that there are questions about cosmology that can be addressed when we understand better uh, um, how to think about, um, well, this emergent gravity in, in, in the city space. So let's have a 15 minutes break and then I'll continue uh, from this equation later on. So in the last uh, 45 minutes, I will, I don't, one hour I think is still left, yeah. until 10. Uh, I want, uh, last hour, I want to get to uh, indeed uh, a proposal that I have that um, the way to, so we discussed uh, in the beginning uh, the idea that uh, there's entanglement entropy associated to a horizon, that the horizon entropy is related to an entanglement entropy. If I take the same point of view also in the sitter space, then uh, I have to associate something to what's being entangled. Uh, even in empty, empty de Sitter space, there's gonna be uh, something that is entangled across the horizon. And the way I view this is that uh, the Sitter space has an, an entropy, it has a temperature, and therefore very different from anti de Sitter space. And the reason uh, it's different is that we have added, uh, well, a dark energy to it, because we started from anti de Sitter space with no dark energy, with a negative, energy even. I think of the actually anti de Sitter space as the ground state and this negative energy I think about as sort of a Casimir energy. Actually the Sitter space, anti de Sitter space can be thought of as something being in a, in, a, in a box of a certain size and then there's a negative energy associated to that just from the vacuum. If you want to get a positive energy you have to add something to it and then we add a temp we have a temperature and we have uh, an entropy, that means that we're no longer in the ground state. I mean, the ground state does not have an entropy and it doesn't have a temperature. So I do think that the sitter space should be thought about as an excited state. And that's a very important uh, distinction. So what is being entangled, therefore, is the things that have added to the, the space time. And this is the dark energy that's there. So I associate the entanglement to the dark energy. I'm gonna actually uh, get back to that uh, when I, I uh, continue. So what I uh, want to continue with is indeed this uh, equation that uh, can be sort of summarizes the way we can think about uh, the Einstein's equations. So J Jacobson actually argued that if this equation holds for any causal diamond, then you can basically, he actually showed, derive the Einstein's equations at least even not even to linearized order, actually in this case can even do it in to all uh, orders. Um, but he had to keep this volume constant. And actually one of the uh, ideas that, that actually uh, my, my own uh, PC student, that's uh, Manus Fischer, actually uh, made clear is that if you have this equation, uh, if you keep the volume constant and the area is decreased, you can also do the other way around. Namely, you can ask what happens if I keep the area constant then it's clear, uh, clearly the volume has to increase. So there's another way of writing the same equation that if you say, if I take this uh, energy and I um, change the state by adding some uh, mass to the system and I impose that the entropy of the area stays constant, then the volume is increasing. It's almost like matter adds something that increases the, the volume. And um, this may have an interpretation. Uh, actually, the paper already has appeared now. Um, and, and indeed, people have thought about volume as being not related to entanglement, but to something called uh, 
quantum complexity and maybe this indeed has an interpretation with that form. I'm going to talk about volumes later because I do think that indeed in the sitter space we should not only think about the area but also about the volume and uh, this is uh, already an indication of that. You can even combine the two equations by saying well let's leave the volume and the area both uh, well undetermined and then indeed the change in en energy can be rewritten as minus the change in entropy uh, plus a change in, in volume. And of course you can then derive the other two forms by it by fixing one of the two. So this is actually the general equation. And why am I showing this? I mean, I already told you that uh, entanglement is sort of measured by areas, but now maybe there's some way in which this term also has uh, a similar interpretation. And indeed, uh, I'm going to say indeed that the entropy that we have in the sitter space should actually be associated with something in the volume. And maybe I can, uh, I'm actually going to, yeah, let me indeed take the full the sitter space. Actually, you can do the, exactly the same thing again. Um, this is the, the causal patch uh, that I talked about before. Uh, already did the calculation where we added mat matter to it and we already showed that the uh, area of the horizon gets this decreased. That was a calculation I did before. And so this is just a special case of the same relation I talked about. But I can also say that if I add matter, the volume is actually increased by this amount. And both equations uh, are, are uh, equivalent, that if I add matter, then the area is being decreased or the volume is increased. The need depends on what I keep constant. Um, yeah, this is actually, um, yeah, if I take another uh, size of the radius, this would be the general equation. Actually, this equation is the same equation as I had here, uh, except I differentiated once with respect to the radius. I'm actually gonna, let me skip this uh, for the moment. Yeah, I'm indeed uh, returning to this uh, picture. Um, I mean, this was the picture we had before. I need, I'm, uh, I'm saying that this entanglement entropy that we have in the sitter space can not be seen as entanglement between the left and the right boundary, but should be viewed as entanglement with something that's living in the bulk and sort of is uh, occupying uh, the volume. And so instead of saying that there is an entropy equal to the area, I'm going to write actually the entropy as an integral over the volume. There's actually a calculation that Gibbons and Hawking did that who calculated actually this entropy. Indeed, when you get it from the Einstein action, actually they get it in this form. And so there's actually a reason to say that maybe uh, the entropy in the sitter space should not be seen as the entropy associated to the, the area, but really is something that's spread over the entire volume. And there's actually a reason for that, namely the... Uh, Dark energy that we have uh, in added to the, the theory that made us the sitter space is uh, something that lives entirely in the volume of space-time. And if I say that the entropy is associated to the dark energy, it's actually much more natural to think about uh, an entropy density uh, instead of a, a, uh, an entropy that is associated only to the area. But it turns out that if you take that entropy and then integrate it over the entire volume, that it must be equal uh, to the area. So this is the picture I'm going to propose uh, for uh, the sitter space. And let's see what uh, consequences it may have. So this is what I'm going to go through next. I'm uh, actually, this is assumptions, but you may also say these are some uh, conclusions that I, I can draw. Uh, I talk, showed you that uh, gravity, or at least argued that gravity can be emerging uh, from entanglement entropy using this first law. Uh, the first law has input uh, we had to put in that the entanglement was given by the area. This is true in anti de Sitter space. This is a, a picture of anti de Sitter space, how I think about it. We indeed drew anti de Sitter space as a disk where the, the CFT is living on the boundary. Um, 
all of the degrees of freedom are actually on the boundary and so what's being entangled are things that are on the boundary. Indeed all the bit threads were going through the boundary and when I then uh, think about entanglement it was like an area in, in this system. The picture of the sitter space is different. Uh, there we don't have uh, a boundary, we have a horizon and a volume uh, that also can be uh, entangled with the horizon. And so I think about the sitter space as an ensemble of excited states, namely it's the number of states is counted by uh, the entropy. By the way, this is enormous large entropy, it's 10 to the 120. But the temperature is incredibly small. And so you may ask, is there a way that we can see that entropy? And indeed, I think that is the case. So what I want to do is indeed think about what the result is, of what, what the consequences is of having a finite entropy density. And we don't think of therefore as a, as a vacuum state, but it's a state that um, has uh, entropy associated uh, to it. Um. Yeah, I'm going to skip some of the next slides. So what I'm actually going to do is uh, give you more of a general idea of why I think this entropy plays a very important role. Um, so in physics, generally when there is entropy, uh, it may not immediately be visible. Um, I'm going to give you a few examples. Uh, glass is one example. If I think about a um, crystal, a crystal is a unique configuration of atoms that you can think about as a ground state. So if I have a glass which is made of crystal, microscopically it looks very different from glass like we have here. And the reason is, is that he, in glass here, the atoms are not arranged in a crystal but randomly. So there's a lot of entropy necessary to describe the state of glass because there are many possibilities. There's no obvious way that we see the difference because they both behave almost the same way but microscopically they look very different. And this may have consequences not immediately but at long time scales. Because glass, if you observe it at very long time scales, it flows. Because it can rearrange, because it can go through all of its different states, but very slowly and not very easily. And this sets a time scale that you immediately don't see. So if something similar is present here, so if I say that the sitter space is like more a glassy state, well the anti sitter space is more like the crystal, the ground state, then they will behave very much the same at short time scales, but at very long time scales they may behave very differently. I'm going to give, do an experiment with this thing. Uh, it bounces like a ball which is just elastic. And there's a theory that describes this is called elasticity. If it really be an, an elastic ball, then I can bounce it every time and it describes how, for instance, it changes under deformations when I apply a pressure or a force, then I know exactly by elastic theory by how much it deforms. Uh, there's even waves associated to this and there's a full theory that I can develop. And even, I mean, this is actually a special kind of material because what is going to happen this is actually made out of polymers and it has a ground state which if it would be a in the ground state it would be a crystal. But clearly this is not going to be a crystal, this is actually a polymers that are entangled with each other in a very complicated way. And they cannot rearrange themselves very easily and so they cannot explore all of their entropy in a short amount of time and this is why if I bounce it, it simply gets frozen in one way and it just acts as if it is a elastic material. But if I put it on the table and I wait, just the motion of the polymers will make it go very slowly into a different state. And it will actually start to flow like a fluid. 
And clearly that behavior is not described by the same theory, not by the elasticity. And so what I'm going to say is actually that space-time has a very similar property when we go from the state that is what we call anti sitter space to the sitter space, namely that there is going to be an enormous set of number of states counted by the entropy of the sitter space in which a dynamics is happening that is not visible at short time scales. And it's going to behave very much like this material. And the theory that we use to, re to measure the response of space-time is general relativity. But general relativity works in anti de sitter space and indeed on short time scales also in the sitter space. But when there is a dynamics at much longer time scales, that may not be described by the same theory. And so that is going to be the analogy that I'm going to make here. So I'm claiming that there is a degeneracy of states in the sitter space with a dynamics that happens at very long time scales that are not observable at any short time scale experiments. So I'm not going to say that general relativity is wrong because it indeed describes correctly the short time scale response of what's going on here. But there may be dynamics happening in this entropy on this large number of states that we don't know about. And I want to indeed uh, argue for this existence. Actually, I'm going to skip a few slides because of the time. Also because the topic will uh, distract a little bit about from what I'm doing here. Namely, there is a, a microscopic picture that may suggest the same thing. Indeed, having to do with this um, entanglement properties that I talked about. So actually, I have a few slides I go through quickly, simply because um, they're not going to be very essential, but they're, they're going to make some point. I want to indeed talk, uh, these slides go a bit about um, entanglement and, and uh, the way they, uh, they can store information. One thing that I want to indeed um, get from this is that there's ways in which, if you think about space-time, as being um, made out of entangled qubits, there's some way in which um, it suggests the same picture. So what I've actually shown here is that um, these are bell pairs. Uh, these are maximally entangled, it's called, because they, uh, if you take a density matrix, it's sort of in the identity. Indeed, one thing that's possible even is to act on uh, operators, say, act operators on the left, um, and change the state in a new state. Or you can have operators that act on the right and also change it in the same way. So maximally entangled states can be uh, controlled in the following way, that if I um, think about a state psi as, so this state is entangled with another state, so there's a sum over the states i with some coefficients a, i, j, uh, sorry, this is the state, so sum over, uh, sum over i. So this is the state psi, so i is clearly entangled with this state. Now, the question is, I want to change the state i. I can do this, of course, by acting with an operator on i. But I can also do it by acting with an operator on psi, namely this operator acting this way. Uh, well, by the way, here must be a conjugate in such a way that if I insert this in here, I end up with this, this state. So uh, clearly uh, there are ways in which I can, if I have entanglement, I can change this state basically by acting on the state by which it's entangled. And this is actually happening in anti sitter space. Wrong. Yes, this one. Um, yeah, let me indeed, as I already was mentioning, I don't want to go through all the details. One thing that actually uh, also can be done is actually encode many, uh, actually let me actually skip this. I want to actually take this picture where indeed I'm thinking about uh, this ne tensor network picture where we think about space time as being made out of a unique set of, um, um, well, vertices which are linked together. You can think about this indeed as a way I make, I make a crystal. And uh, this is a way of making uh, ADS space. 
And this has a unique state. Actually, the picture looks like it is sort of more like a glassy one, but anyway, it has a unique ground state because there's no excitations in here. You can have excitations by adding things in the bulk, which are like sort of yeah, excitations that are um, associated the, with these vertices. Um, actually, what I will indeed go through is actually yeah, this picture. Maybe this is what I will summarize. This picture actually very naturally explains this area law that I talked about, namely when there's no, just all the entanglement is being basically given through to the boundary, then the entanglement area law tells you that when you take a line through here, you're cutting lines and you just count how many lines you cut and this gives you an area law. This is this, this picture. And so the area is simply the number of lines that I cut because each line represents one uh, unit of entanglement. What I'm going to argue is that there is another form of entanglement that is not an area law. And actually, this is sort of more of an intuitive picture. Uh, if I have short range entanglement, that means that things are entangled just with their neighbors, and you draw a line through that, this is actually what a ground state looks like, which has no excitations. Then it needs uh, areas the, the entanglement can grow like the area because, because what I said, you just count how many lines you're cutting in here. If you have long range entanglement, this actually happens when there's uh, thermal excitations, for instance, particles here being entangled with things that are very far. Then if you draw a line around it, the number of points here will grow like the volume. So there's different ways in which indeed uh, information here can be stored. Here is something that uh, all the information is basically on the boundary and the area, uh, the entanglement can only go like areas. But if information is stored in the bulk, entanglement will indeed grow with the volume. And this is, I, I claim, is the situation for uh, the sitter space. And so the picture is more like this is where I, and this is actually where I had my uh, story. Uh, this is indeed uh, more like anti sitter space where there's a unique ground state and it looks like a ground state like quartz or a crystal. This is more like a glass where I added excitations and the state carries a lot of entropy also in the bulk. And so my suggestion indeed is, is that anti sitter space more, works more like this and uh, the sitter space more like that. And there's also actually from string theory uh, ways of arguing this and this has to do with indeed how we think about entropy in the sitter space I already mentioned actually in reply to your question that uh, normally when we ask how much entropy can be sit in, in the phase where string theory describes particles it's very little but in the phase where we have horizons and black holes then suddenly we have a lot of entropy but it's also entropy that's distributed over very long range degrees of freedom and actually in excitations that are very low energy. Uh, and so actually this is very much like the kind of material that I have in here. It's sort of like the, uh, this is kind of like the polymer picture where the, the excitations uh, are contained in long strings. Well, this is pictures actually what's called usually short strings. And in string theory, we even understand this picture uh, quite, quite precisely. Finally, this is another argument which is uh, going back to this idea about horizons. I already told you there can be entanglement with excitations uh, using this wormhole picture. This is actually the situation when uh, indeed the black hole uh, is entangled with the radiation in here. The black hole horizons are sitting on the inside. This is a picture of a cosmological horizon which I try to draw a very similar idea, namely that the cosmological horizon is sort of entangled uh, with the, what's in the inside. And these are the excitations that are part of the sitter space. So this is the picture I eventually gonna uh, propose. So this is, I'm going back to the sitter space. Now what I'm gonna actually um, show, maybe I should announce that. Is that in the, yeah. What I wanna show and actually argue is that there's some observable consequences of this. So uh, the idea I'm going to have, I'm going to start with uh, empty de sitter space and I'm going to add again matter and I'm going to calculate effects of uh, the additional entropy that I have now in the system. So the idea that I proposed 
before the break was that if I add matter, it removes part of the entropy. Well, in any de Sitter space, uh, there's some way in which this leads to uh, normal gravity. This is the picture in the Sitter space. So I have said the Sitter space is also has a horizon. There's uh, thermal excitations associated with it that are filling up the volume. And there's some way that if I add matter to it, there will be effect on the way that gravity here works because of the presence of this entropy. And this I'm going to estimate when this is going to happen. What I'm going to estimate is how much entropy does matter remove? Actually, I did the calculation already. How much entropy is present in the dark energy? And then I'm going to say, when does the dark energy entropy become important? There's going to be an inequality that tells me that the amount of matter that, matter, that uh, entropy that matter removes is going to be larger or smaller than the amount of entropy that's present in the dark energy. That's going to put a criterion on when this is going to happen. Something is going to happen. If the matter namely removes all of the entropy, we're back in this situation and it looks like empty uh, space, no excitations. But as soon as the amount of matter actually removes less than the amount of entropy that's present, I expect this entropy to show up. And actually this is going to happen in observations. And this is just an estimate. And I already gave you basically all the ingredients. So this is the sitter space. And so now the assumption is, and this is the hypothesis that I tried to um, motivate by the, the previous slide, is that there is uh, inside our horizon an amount of dark energy. Uh, there's an entropy that's equal to the area of that horizon. And I'm going to claim that the dark energy carries all that entropy. Then I'm going to ask how much entropy is actually contained, therefore, in a region not of size L, but of a size smaller than the size of the, 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 the city space. Well, the hypothesis is that it's indeed uh, carried by the dark energy, and therefore it has a volume law. So it must grow like the volume, but I want to make it such that if I take the size of the region equal to L, that it gives me the area precisely. And then there's, this is the unique answer because this grows like the volume because, well, the area times R is something that grows like the volume. But I've chosen the normalization in such a way that if I put R equals to L, that I get back this result. So this tells me how much entropy there is inside a region of size R. So now I also want to estimate how much uh, entropy actually matter takes away. And I'm actually think about this matter as something uh, large, uh, namely a galaxy. And namely, there is going to indeed be a situation where the amount of matter that is in there is sort of center, in the, near the center. And we're going to indeed find that there is a, a crossover where this amount of entropy is precisely being removed. Uh, and then it drops below it and something is going to happen. Namely, this is what's going to happen. So this is uh, a galaxy. Um, this is the center, and this is where the radius goes, and this is uh, the velocity. So you measure the velocity simply by redshifts, and what we know is the amount of matter that we see, we call it the baryons. And this would be the normal uh, equation uh, that applies here. Actually, I don't need to use general relativity here. It's all non-relativistic, non and therefore it's just Newtonian gravity. So this is the, the, the force. This is, or yeah, per unit of mass, this is the acceleration. And therefore, you see the power of R tells you that V must decrease when most of the matter is in the center. And this is what you expect, indeed, that the velocity goes down. That's not what happens. It actually stays constant in a way that uh, is kind of surprising because the difference here becomes quite large. And this is where the dark matter needs to be added in such a way that this equation must describe then this behavior. Now, there is actually a, a typical fact for all um, galaxies, is namely that when you ask what is the acceleration at which this deviation starts happening, it all happens at the same acceleration scale. And I already introduced this acceleration scale before. If you multiply h0 with c, uh, you get an acceleration parameter. 
By the way, the observation I'm mentioning here is, is due to Milgram. Uh, he indeed noticed that there's an acceleration scale that determines when dark matter effects become important. Namely, when, ne when this acceleration drops below about half uh, this number, uh, then this is when it starts happening. Now, this equation is going to be precisely going to be, I'm going to rewrite this in terms of the entropies that I had before. And actually, it's going to tell me something about... Um, Actually, this is what, what I wrote before, namely that the acceleration drops below uh, this A0. So A0 is uh, this equation. Um, so I'm going to rewrite this equation. Um, I can write G as 4 pi G M over A, where A is just four, uh, two pi, uh, 4 pi R squared, of course. This is the same acceleration. So this equation can then, if I insert that in here, can be rewritten in the following way. I bring the A0 on the left, and this is an entropy. By the way, H bar A0 over 2 pi is the temperature, the de Sitter temperature. So this is the mass, the mass that I entered, divided by the de Sitter temperature. This is the entropy of a black hole of that size. So what I've done here, I've looked at the mass inside a certain region, and when this inequality holds, this is when this starts happening. I can even rewrite it slightly differently. Actually, this is uh, even easier. This was the entropy that I told you is present in dark energy inside a radius R. This is the entropy that is associated with a mass of size r. Actually, already had those equations in the earlier parts. If you add a mass, we indeed knew how much the, the area was, was decreased. It was actually this number. And so when this number drops below this, this is when the flattening happens. So there's an immediate interpretation of what's going on here. So m is the sum of mv and mv? <coughs> no. It's just a baryonic mass. mass. Uh, so, because actually, when this is larger, we're staying in the same area. So the equality holds basically in this region. So where the dark, amount of dark matter uh, is still negligible. Can I think of this as um, not satisfying the first law of thermodynamics? And I have to add an extra term to I see this that there's an additional force because what is actually uh, necessary is that we keep the galaxy together because it's actually rotating much faster. Now, you might say that's because there's dark matter and that creates the additional force. But there's another explanation which is indeed that this is due to the interaction with matter and the dark energy that's present. And that's I'm going to indeed argue. So why would you say it's a different... So this one Bob's equation. Yes. Uh, looks like. Well. At least the previous one, when you had the uh, the residual temperature. So when the equality holds, that's sort of like a first law. Exactly. But actually, uh, you have to think about this area. This is okay. I had namely a first law where there would be delta here. This would be the change of the area of the cosmological horizon. That was exactly what we did here. This area is the area of the, the, the sphere that's containing this amount of mass. So this would be the entropy of a, of a black hole of that size. So you're basically saying here, if I take the mass m and I divide it up in quanta, which have the de Sitter temperature, that number, when it's smaller than the size of that horizon, somehow that is when this happened. This has not an immediate interpretation. This equation has a much better interpretation because this actually is the amount of entropy that's present in the dark energy when I propose it is distributed over the volume because this is precisely this volume expression. This is the entropy that mass takes away uh, from a region of space. And actually maybe, yeah, I can actually say this here. Uh, so this was the, f the first equation I had, but this is actually another way of rewriting it. And I say the left-hand side is ex indeed the amount of, uh, m well, how do you say it, the amount of dark energy that must be entangled with this matter 
uh, inside a certain region of size r. It's also, by the way, the expression that Bekenstein wrote down. It's sort of the Bekenstein entropy, or what you uh, would calculate from a model Hamiltonian of some uh, um, inside a causal diamond of size uh, r. Anyway, this is an, obs uh, an observable fact. Uh, actually, it follows from observation. Actually, I have a natural interpretation of it. Indeed, in that the dark uh, energy uh, takes uh, effect. Actually, here I've given you that calculation, by the way. How much entanglement indeed is associated with matter can actually even derive from um, a gravity law. If I say, uh, I already told you that the areas decrease when I add matter to a certain amount. I'm actually, that, that equation I already wrote down. It's the same equation I had before. Indeed, if I add matter and I compute what uh, the metric does, um, actually the area becomes smaller basically because you introduce uh, Newton's constant. That calculation I've done already before of Newton's uh, potential. So mass actually creates an area deficit and if you calculate that area deficit, uh, there's actually an entropy associated to it. Um, well, this is actually the calculation of the derivative of the change in the area, but if you integrate it, you get exactly this uh, expression that I had before. So this is indeed the, the, the entropy that matter takes away and actually it indeed uh, makes the, the space curve. And this is one way to think about how gravity works in, in, uh, in general uh, space times, namely that matter removes a part of the uh, entanglement and therefore it removes part of the area and that also explains this uh, minus sign. And this expression is exactly the expression I put here on the left hand side. And on the right hand side, I have this uh, entropy in the dark, dark energy. And why these two numbers? Well, while something happens, that's actually the picture that I've already indicated here. This part of the geometry is then without uh, entropy because this is where uh, this is larger. But as soon as it becomes smaller, then the amount of entropy in the dark energy is present and something will ha need to happen. May I ask a question? Yes, go ahead. So, um, uh, okay, so if, if I understand correctly, basically the interpretation here is that the matter, when you create some matter, it takes away the entanglement from the nearby space, yes. thereby make, making it kind of empty anti deciterish so that the real, uh, the pure, let's say, Einstein kicks in and then it behaves normally. Okay, so. Um, if you really create a, lot, a big chunk of matter, it may, it, of course you cannot take entanglement from empty space in, in, in your language. Then you make pro probably you take entanglement from nearby regions, there, thereby making the, a bigger region empty. So you kind of create That's it. That's right. Then the, my question is, if, if this entanglement, let's say, is so mobile that you can take it from nearby regions, why wouldn't it fill in the, 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 the space that is around the galaxy, for example, which presumably... So if, if the entropy would behave like a fluid, yeah, exactly. where you would take it away and it can immediately go back in but you can, and you replace it. It seems you, can, you have to assume it if you, if, you, if you have to assume that it's possible to create large chunks of matter in this room. All right. So think about the story about glass mm -hmm. or the story I spell, told there. What happens is that the space around the matter is turned into a crystal. Mm -hmm. And on the outside, we still have this liquid phase. The dynamics is incredibly small, slow. It's slow dynamics at a time scale that we cannot immediately observe. Because in order to bring the entropy there, the space time has to rearrange itself and change its entanglement structure in a way that makes it look like the glass again. The amount of time that's necessary to do it is very slow. So what happens to glass is actually, it's a fluid, I told you. But it's a very viscous fluid where it takes an enormous amount of time for it to flow. So I'm saying the same thing happens here. So we've taken away part of the entropy, but the amount of time needed to fill that back in takes a very long time. And so the system should be treated as being out of equilibrium and not something that we have um, immediately back into equilibrium. I think what you're proposing is actually indeed to think about a dark energy as a fluid that would immediately fill up everything. So one of my predictions actually is indeed is that dark energy is being expelled from regions where there's a lot of matter. 
and therefore the dark energy that makes uh, the universe sort of expand is mostly present in regions outside of our galaxy and it's driving galaxies apart. But inside the galaxy it's mostly uh, um, expelled because of the fact that we have matter formed there. So indeed uh, I think that in the sitter space you cannot just create matter out of nothing. It has to sort of use the energy that is there and the entropy therefore gets reduced locally. That's exactly the correct picture, and that's also the way I, I do the calculation. Yeah, it's just something that seemed unnatural at first, because it seems that you can create a galaxy and then move it to some <laughs> other place, and then it will be observable here, but probably that's the wrong picture, because you cannot move a galaxy uh, with, without the loss of uh, following just the gravity, and then probably it kind of makes it the whole thing self-contained. Well, what you can do is have two clusters of galaxies form. They create this empty part and then they collide. Yeah. This is what happens in the bullet cluster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And there you see the effect of what happened, and this is where people actually claim to find the evidence, but what I'm claiming indeed is what you have created behaves effectively like dark matter and just moves on while the matter uh, collides. And so there's no way that the effect that I predict here is, it is connected to the amount of matter that was created but it's not tied to it in the way that there's some modified force law. So I'm going to do an estimate where I indeed assume that matter is formed in a, in a local way without being, having been disturbed and where I can use sort of static approximations. Okay. And actually this is what I, I sort of have here. I'm going to indeed say, um, actually here I'm summarizing a bit. Uh, that matter changes the entanglement structure and leads to this area de deficit. Normally this re just leads to the curvature of space-time. But I'm adding dark energy to it with an entropy equal to the sitter horizon. I'm going to change the same, do the same calculation, but I'm actually calculating what's the response of this moving away the entropy. And actually it's going to behave like elasticity, actually very similar to that material that I described. And actually the calculation can be taken over even from the literature of those, uh, those things. I may not actually um, go through all the details here also because of the time. I want to actually go a little bit to the final uh, formulas. What I want to namely connect to is a formula uh, for uh, precisely this behavior. And there's a very precise uh, relationship. Um, this is uh, the observations. And this is what, ex so this is the radius and this is sort of the, the observations are this line and this is what is ex expected. So I already had these equations uh, before. So if you take the acceleration due to the baryons, it's only described in terms of the observable mass. Uh, this is the observed acceleration, but that should also include the dark, dark matter. Now, if dark matter is really an independent particle, you might say I just can add any amount that I like. Turns out there is indeed a very close relationship between the amount of baryons and the amount of dark matter. Even though the amount of dark matter is, is much larger, and certainly in the regions uh, out here, because here you see that ordinary matter only gives this kind of acceleration, while here there's a lot more. Now these uh, astronomers actually, they did a survey of many galaxies, and they plotted these two quantities uh, in a log-log plot for this many data points, and they found a very striking correlation. Um, and the correlation uh, is expressed as follows, namely this is uh, the baryonic uh, acceleration, this is the observed one. If there would be no dark matter, uh, they would be equal and you would follow this diagonal. But of course the dark matter moves it up. But as I said, I mean there's no reason why the amount of dark matter a priori would depend on the amount of baryons, but it, it seems to do so. So there's a relationship that is quite well uh, well, at least by averaging, you find that the dots, the average uh, accelerations are all on, on a, a curve that in this regime sort of seems to behave, a, a, has a scaling law. By the way, you know that in log-log plots, if something becomes a linear line, that means a, a scaling law. And the scaling law looks like this. Um, actually, it can be almost understood from the fact that the rotation curves start flattening, uh, namely that there must be a square a relationship between this observation, the observed uh, um, acceleration and the baryonic one. Because if I take the square roots out of this expression, then it goes like 1 over r, and then in the v squared over r 
It actually besides C explains why the velocities are, are constant. And this is the relation. If I take the square of this observation, uh, observed acceleration at a certain distance and I compare it to the baryonic one, uh, then uh, there's an acceleration scale that needs to be put in just because of dimensional ground and that the acceleration scale precisely uh, involves uh, this um, Hubble parameter. Actually, this is the Hubble parameter of the current times. That's why it's called H0, the present day Hubble constant. Uh, and there's some factor of six that somehow comes in. This I call the Milgram phenomenology. It's, it's a phenomenological relation that indeed can be explained on basis on the picture that I, I, I just outlined. And this is a calculation, as I said, I don't want to go into too much detail. The way that I derived it actually uh, is by rewriting it in a, in a slightly uh, different way. If you uh, take this result, I'm going to integrate it over the volume. So I'm going to insert the right hand side on the right hand side and integrating over the volume. That means I'm multiplying with r squared and then integrate. And then it looks like this. This is uh, sort of the analog of the gravitational energy inside a certain uh, part of space. So I integrate up to a certain radius r. And on the right hand side, I indeed have this quantity, which is the same combination I had actually before, mcr over h bar, multiplying by this, uh, this number. This relation is one that one can derive, actually. And it would be equivalent to uh, this observation. And the way I do it is actually precisely by using just the estimate of how much entropy do I remove, how much uh, uh, does the dark energy contain, and then I treat the dark energy as an elastic medium. And uh, I've tried to explain this before to many people, but then I find out that elasticity is one of those subjects that people have forgotten about or never learned, although it's 19th century. Uh, physics, but uh, I, I'll go quickly a little bit through the equations. Elasticity is described in terms of displacements. Uh, you, this was the equation I already had before. The change in area leads to this and actually can be related to a displacement of the volume. I already told you how the volume changes. And then the amount of volume that's been taken away is rewritten in terms of the amount of displacement that you have. So uh, if I displace a medium, uh, I remove a certain amount of volume that's equal to the area times its displacement. That's expressed here. So that's the volume that's been taken out. And I know how much volume is taken out because I know how much entropy is taken out. Here I use the fact that I know also what the entropy density is. And this exactly allows me to calculate how much volume is being uh, removed. And then I can treat indeed this uh, stuff as an elastic medium. And there's some equations indeed about elasticity that as I said, I probably shouldn't even try to explain. It is in textbooks. This is um, Landau and Lifshitz, if you want to refresh your memory. Uh, there are some elasticity constants. This thing is called the strain tensor. And this is uh, the um, stress tensor. And they are related by some Hooke's law. There are wave equations that you can write down in here even. And what I actually assume, and this is one of the things that sort of comes out very naturally, is that actually the density is equal to the cosmological energy density of dark energy. There's also a shear modulus, and that actually predicts even what the sound waves uh, would look like in this medium. Um, but eventually, I can connect this to the equations I had before. Uh, namely, uh, I told you that there's a relationship between the displacement and the Newton's potential. And then I can uh, calculate what is the force that results from removing a certain amount of uh, volume. And this is indeed by relating quantities in elastic uh, to the gravitational one. So what we're going to calculate actually are quantities in the elastic theory. But then I can translate it back into elastic uh, gravitational quantities. And what I'm going to end up with, and actually I'm going to just briefly show this, if you remove a certain amount of volume, this calculation was done in just standard literature on, on elasticity, I can calculate what is the elastic energy in that material. It turns out to be proportional to the amount of volume that you have removed. I already told you the elastic energy, I'm going to actually compare it to the gravitational energy, and I'm going to compare it to the amount of volume that is removed, which actually is determined by the mass that I put in. And it's by those equations that um, I get this equation, the relationship between the 
actually the, the elastic energy and the mass comes out. But this one, I'm going to actually translate. The strain is going to be related to G. And eventually, I'm ending up with the same equation I had before. Oh, this is one. This is the equation, indeed, that comes out from that calculation. And I already told you, this summarizes observable data. And that sort of, I mean, the fact that I can do an estimate of this sort, I t told you that I make estimates. The numbers that come in are very natural. I just take the energy density, I take the entropy density that I know about, I take quantities I know about the sitter space, and I have a story that tells me that this is the equation that should come out. And that's an equation that has been observed. I've also given you reasons why I think the sitter space works differently than anti the sitter space. And I do think that the key is to indeed associate the entropy in the sitter space to the dark energy and to associate the dynamics to it at a scale that is much smaller, lower than any observable scale. But they interact, the matter and the dark energy sort of interact when this starts happening. Of course, there's a lot more that dark matter uh, explains in cosmology, and there's a lot of things that you want to reproduce if you want to claim that this is uh, an alternative to dark matter. But personally, I have to say that uh, the reason for adding dark matter is a big assumption about the way that gravity works, namely that it works in the same way at all scales up to cosmological scales. And indeed, there was no reason to doubt that that's the case. But I think the, the reasoning that I've given, that the fact that the sitter space has a very different ground state than anti the sitter space, and the way that the entropy is distributed over uh, the space-time uh, starts playing a role, there is actually a reason why gravity would work differently. Because the assumptions that in derive in Einstein's equations were that the entanglement is purely going like the area, and there's no volume contribution. If there is a volume contribution, things may change, and they precisely change at the point where we see these observations uh, changing. And so even though I'm not claiming to have a complete theory, I mean, I've made estimates of what is going on, and certainly dynamical questions that need to be addressed have not been calculated yet, but I think these are strong indications that some things uh, are going on. I mean, the, the final slides are more about uh, consequences of this relation. I can make rewritings of the relations in terms of the, the energy, the entropy, sorry, the, the mass densities. Uh, you get an equation, um, actually I should skip this. I'm not even sure why I'm showing, oh, going forward or backward. Now actually I'm gonna actually end here. How did I end up here? Yeah, let me end here actually. In the sense that I have uh, a way of rewriting these relations in terms of uh, average densities. One of the things you can, for instance, do is calculate what this equation would imply for cosmological abundances. If I can calculate the amount of uh, baryons on average and the amount of uh, dark matter on average, actually this relation, when I insert this in here, predicts uh, relationships between uh, the average dark matter density and baryonic dark uh, density. And I can rewrite this even in terms of the abundances, which are defined as um, sort of the, the ratios of uh, the baryons with the, the critical density. And it turns out that these relations that you find here actually can be compared to observations, both in clusters as well as even the, 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 the cosmological densities. And so there are several tests of this relationship. Uh, however, as I said, I mean, there are also questions I, I cannot answer yet, which have to do with the role of dark matter in, say, galaxy formation or even uh, the early universe and, of course, the CMB. But this, uh, I have to say, are uh, based on assumptions that we can indeed extrapolate the gravity equations all the way back. Uh, what I need to do is indeed, if I want to replace dark matter by an effect like this, that I can reproduce the same effects in, in, in those um, situations. Anyway, I want to just end here and then maybe allow for a few questions. <laughs>